On this episode of Life After, we have a very special guest from my past. We used to go to church together. She is here to talk to us about divorce, sexuality, and most importantly, how to be yourself. I'm Brady Harden, and this is The Life After. Hi, I'm Brady Harden. I'm the host of uh, The Life After, and with me is... Chuck Parson. The other host. The other host. Chuck, I want to talk to you something before we begin. Um, I got to thinking about four different elements that I grew up with growing up in the church that always made me feel like non-Christians were like a different species. Right. And okay, I don't know. I think I know where okay, and tell me this. tell me if you if you experience any of this. Uh-huh. One of the first things I noticed is we were always taught that uh non Christians that in relationships or marriages don't actually truly love each other because God is love and you can only love if you had God. I I am familiar with that. I, I never I don't think I ever personally adopted that. Like it was a it was a little different like I wasn't raised to to believe that, but yeah, no, I've heard that. And, it's, and I don't think it was intentional right. necessarily. It's just kind of like one of those weird by, byproducts. And then right. like, I don't know if you're like me too, where you would get these different ideas and then you would kind of like combine them with other ones and it'd create like this whole worldview. Okay. So like, secondly, another one was I was taught, um, for instance, because I'm gay, I guess this really stuck with me, um, that growing up that, that gay people only become gay uh, because they choose it. Okay, or right. they had bad parenting, right, like right, a, right. a mom that was. And that even was too... even if they have bad parenting, even if it's conditional, like they it's they're still choosing it, right? I mean, that's still, right, right. We're like the the idea that that homosexuality is a choice is like still very prominent. I well, actually remember recently I was invited to basically like my friend who is struggling with his faith put together a panel okay. of people in different sort of uh, stages of Christianity or different, like there were some left Christians and some right Christians. Gosh, and it's so npr I love it. It was, it was actually, it was cool to an extent, but I was the only person there that was like actively, like I'm not a Christian. Oh, wow. So I was representing the entire rest of the world. (laughs) Yes. All Gentiles. And there was a point where, uh, the conversation came to this head where I was like, you know, I basically said like gay people don't choose to be (sighs) gay. And like four or five people in the room were just like, it's like, I, it's like their brains just scrambled and they were like, well, you don't know that. And I was just like, (laughs) done at that point i was just like th- like nobody believes that anymore right like, right like how can like, exactly and i didn't know what i literally didn't know what to say because everything up until that point was like i could like respond to and that i was so taken aback i was like oh yeah people still believe this it was funny right before i came out on facebook i kind of like dropped some hints on people and one of them was i said if a hundred people who are who are gay say that it's not a choice i would believe them over a hundred people who aren't gay who say it is a choice yeah um and it's just complete logic but some right. people start that's when i started to realize like oh me coming out is going to be a difficult thing because people responded to it very negatively but all that to say like i, I had this idea that people who are gay aren't really who they think they are. Mm -hmm. They're just mistaken. Mm -hmm. And so that weird thought still sticks with me. So the the first element that I mentioned was um, that the non-Christians can't really love. Secondly, that uh, gays are just a response to their surroundings, um, Mm -hmm. but they still choose and they're not really, you know, like that. Another one was um, they take that verse about how everyone believes in their hearts that there really is a God. Um, oh, right. And that kind of like comes as a way of like, well, if I say that I'm an atheist, well, no, you're not because, right. you know, um, yeah. Ken Ham is, is very, very known for this. Is he okay? Like, well, there's no such scene as a real atheist because the Bible says, right. well, no, you're using the Bible to support the Bible, to support the Bible, to support the Bible. It just kind of creates... Um, Right. And then the last thing I noticed uh, growing up in that situation is we were always taught that people who did good things who were not Christians, for instance, building hospitals or taking care of the poor. Right. Like, like Oprah building schools. 
or any like, of that. She's yeah. not. She's not like a Christian in the in the traditional sense. So, so we were taught that it was it was in a good work because it wasn't done for the right reasons. Right. It, it doesn't count. It doesn't count. Right. Yeah, that reminds me of this uh, this illustration that that hung with, that stuck with me for years uh, from the, the one the one of the churches I grew up in, uh, where the pastor was talking about this guy dies, and this was like a I think this was more of an evangelical service, right? So it was mm-hmm. it was it was meant to be to cater to non-believers. And he tells this story about this guy who, you know, dies and goes to heaven and he's having a, this conversation with God and God is basically like, or, you know, St. Peter or whoever. And he's basically like, well, if you want to get into heaven, you have to have, you know, uh, something like 100 good good works points or a thousand or something like that. We'll like say yeah, a thousand, some sort of currency. We'll say a thousand, we'll say a thousand good person points, right? Okay. And the... And the and the guy's like, oh, okay, well, you know, I uh, I adopted an African child and raised him and put him through college and and they're successful, whatever. Mm-hmm. And then God's like, okay, that's good for three points. And the guy's like, that's only that's only three points. Like I I spent my entire life on that, you know. Mm-hmm. And he's like, okay, okay, okay. Well, you know, I, I mean, that was I, a really pricey kid, right? Right. I saw. You know? Yeah. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so I, you know, oh, I, I, uh, this one time there was a burning building, and I went into the building and I saved a, a child from the burning building. And God's like, okay, that's good for two points. And the guy's like, how am I ever going to get, you know, to to the point where I can get in? I, I'll never get a thousand points. And the the point was, you know, that that accepting Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior is worth like fifteen hundred points, like a million points, you know, and you just like you can never do it. You just waltz right in, you know. So you can never do it by this. works. You have to do it. The only way exactly. to get okay. not not by right. works, but by faith. The whole thing from James, but it creates this really backwards way of of viewing morality and and how we should behave as humans, and it's it's extremely problematic. You can literally sit on your ass and do nothing to help anybody or you can you know you know contribute to the holocaust or you can you know do whatever whatever you want but, whatever good or bad thing that and it literally means nothing as long as you've prayed that prayer exactly. or like or you're going to church or whatever you know and we've seen that politically i mean i i remember during the election there were there was a facebook thing going around that uh, Dr. James Dobson said that Paula White said that she knew that, you know, Donald Trump asked Jesus in his heart and that the only reason he's acting the way he still is because he's still a baby Christian, but he is a Christian. So everybody should trust and, and vote for him was yes. the, the idea. And that it's, and it's, it's, you know, and who was standing right behind him during the whole religious liberty discrimination. It bill, seems Paul like White. this harmless belief that just, Oh, that's just what Christians believe. But when it's on this scale, exactly, it causes these incredibly destructive social problems. So I guess what I'm trying to tell you is, is here are the four weird things, the weird elements that I grew up with. And I still, to this day, Chuck, have problems getting that out of my mind and realizing that there are times where I even question my own sexuality. I question all these other things of like, is it real? Am I really a meaningful person? Do I really matter uh-huh. now right. that I've, now that you're not, in, now that yeah. I'm a religious. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's not that a group of Christians got in a room together and they're like, Oh, how could we mess up Brady's thinking for the rest of his life? Right. It no, wasn't no, intentional. No, it's, it's just these little things that seem harmless. Right. But when you, you, you give them to a kid who wants to make connections and wants to really understand the worldview, right. um, it does kind of mess this up a little bit. You know what, Brady though, <sighs> Like, yes, that, that kind of thinking does, it seeps in, but I feel now so much more alive and, and, yeah. and, and real than I ever did as a, as a religious person, because at some point, I remember this was such a monumental thing for me when I first, like in the first few months after I stopped being a Christian, it was just like, I can ask the question, what does Chuck want and what's good for yes. Chuck and what do I yes, need? Yes, yes, yes. And respond by doing that and pursuing it. I, I realized I was I was kind of directionless before that because I'm kind of a jack of all trades and I couldn't decide which way to go and I was trying to find God's direction for my life. And then I, I quit Christianity and I, I just sat, you know, and, and thought about what do I really want? And that's when I decided like, I really need to de- dedicate my life to to making music. Like that's what makes me happy. That's what mm-hmm. I'm good at. Uh, that's what. That's the way that I like help other people. And like, you had so many less filters to look through. 
Yes. And just it, able to see it, the world for the first time. It became clear. It was, it was similar to that to me, too. It was like those videos that you watch where people are able to see color for the first time if they're colorblind right. and put on those glasses. I was able to see, like, oh, wow. Like, there's such another world to me. And, of course, with, with the religious trauma syndrome, th- thoughts come back in. You have to stop them. Went to therapy, figured all this out. Right. Of like, yeah. you listen to them. You let them go through your mind. Then you make the decision. Is this productive or not? No, it's not productive. Right. So now I reject that thought. Yep. So, um. I know I'm kind of. Man, I'm, you've got that down. I, pff, therapy. Yeah. You needed. Yeah. I needed yeah. something, it's man. True. Um, and so it's been really helpful for me. But it, I do kind of. I am a little encouraged that I'm not alone in that. That you do have some of those same things that you deal yeah, yeah. with, and I know some of our listeners probably do as well. Definitely. Um, which brings me to our next guest. Yeah. Today's guest. Um, today's I'm guest. Really excited for this. Guest. I am very excited about. Um, today we are talking to my friend Marnie. Marnie is very special to me on this show for several reasons. Um, Marnie came from the same church that I came from, uh, the one that disfellowshipped me um, during my divorce and everything. Marnie had a very similar experience that she got a lot of bad advice and a lot of bad counsel from the same people that I did. And I wanted to bring her on the show um, because out of a lot of the people in my life, she's experienced similar things with the same people. And I thought it'd be really good to bring her on the show. So right after this break, we're going to bring in Marnie. She's going to tell us her story. And um, I think we're going to have some really good insight. The Life After Facebook page is a great way to get in touch with other religion survivors. Also, we like to post interesting articles on there. And it's a good way to get a hold of us. And you won't need a concordance to find us. <laughs> we- we have a link to the Facebook page on our website, thelifeafter.org, or search The Life After on Facebook. Finally, you could just go to our URL, facebook.com slash thelifeafterorg. And we're back uh, here with Marnie. Marnie, how are you doing tonight? Oh, I'm doing well. I'm so glad you're here. I was so excited like when I messaged you. I'm like, oh my God, Marnie, it'd be so good to talk to Oh, thank you. Because we haven't seen each other in how many years? Oh, my goodness. It's been a lot of years. Actually, probably at church. Probably Mm -hmm. at church. Because before I got here tonight, I went back and I read all of our Facebook messages. Mm -hmm. Like like, like a a teenage girl who's going to crush. Oh, my God. I'm so in love with him. (laughs) Um, But I I, I read those. And the last time that we we saw each other was during our divorces. Wow. Which mine was like four years ago or so. And yours was four years ago, wasn't it? Yes. It was, yes. um, but I want to talk about your divorce in a little bit. <laughs> We're gonna put a pin in that. Um, how did you end up at the same church as me? What was kind of your your journey of starting to go to church and all of that? I ended up at the same church as you because mm-hmm. that is the church my husband chose at the time. It was the most conservative. Mm-hmm. It was the mo- it was teaching the submission and quiverful and all that stuff. So the submission of Quiverful was important to him. Very much now, so. Now, for some of our listeners. Yeah. Let's How do you get... not know what Quiverful means? <laughs> Come on, guys. Everybody. I know, like, some of you are at least picturing, like, a pilgrim or something. I don't really know. I mean, like, it's I such do. an archaic I do. word. It is such an archaic uh, word. Quiverful. Can you break that down real quick? One of you guys... Because I wasn't like quite in that culture, but I Marty, I'm going to leave this to you. It. I want to leave <laughs> define quiverful for us. Because he's right, I'm picturing Legolas in a in a pilgrim in a pilgrim outfit. Right, a quiver. Yeah. So it's it, my understanding is that it's like uh, it's like you have you ha- you have a family, you get married, you have a family, and the purpose thereof uh, is is procreation, and you crank right. out as many kids as you can. And that's how you become a happy, fulfilled individual, and you you uh, you fulfill God's will, right? That's right. And the word quiverful came from the arrows because each of your children is considered an arrow yeah. in Scripture. It's all referred to that, right? And you're supposed to have as many children because let leave that to God, right? Yeah, right, right. So just no no form of birth control or anything. Just have go, more just kids go. so you can exactly. shoot more people. Yeah, <laughs> with the arrow, right? Exactly. Right, right. Exactly. Now, how long did you, did you always homeschool your kids or? I started homeschooling when my oldest one was in about second grade. Okay. Yeah. She was having trouble because she was um, labeled as 
learning impairment. Um, we've discovered since then that it's Asperger's syndrome. She's autistic. Uh, mm-hmm. But at the time that the school wasn't taking care of it and we had tried different schools and different tests and it, it just wasn't working. Mm-hmm. So we, I started investigating and found stuff on the internet, the ancient slow inter- dial-up internet. And right. <laughs> <laughs> um, read some stories and these people were not religious. They weren't. But no, not at all. And... <laughs> So Chuck's still laughing at my at my dial up internet impression because right, yeah, it was that good. <laughs> okay, but um, the people that you were reading this stuff were they more liberal or how did that? They are very liberal. They were actually very liberal. Um, they believed in teaching teaching a child the way the child focused. It seems like sensible, so, right? Yeah, a sensible way. And most of these people had PhDs or masters or bachelors. I mean, they were degreed right. people. So it was like your kid, your kid is going to learn a certain way. Uh, the small, smaller cl- classroom size basically is exactly. homeschooling. So exactly. you can cater their education to more one on one or as close to it as your kid. Which in your case is very, very, very helpful, right? Because uh, you know, yeah, your your daughter was having a hard time learning in a traditional setting. Right. And and then when I reached out to the homeschool community here in the area, in the middle of Missouri, it was Bible all Bible. very all religious. <laughs> very religious conservative. Very religious yeah. conservative. They all homeschooled for religious reasons. And I didn't dare say why I right. was there. Right, right, right. You were, you were the outsider when you, when you, oh, when you got in there. Oh, very much so. It was much easier just to... I really needed to glean the information from them so I could homeschool my daughter. So I just kind of was going with the flow, and they seemed happy. You and needed nice a, and... a support community. They didn't seem like terrible people, so you you kind of went with it. Exactly. This is really interesting for me because I was homeschooled, right? but I was on the uh, you know, like my family was on the opposite side. They they got into because you guys did for the conservative reasons for religious reasons. Yeah, for yeah. religious conservative reasons. Um, and my my dad is definitely the, a, a quiverful, you know, uh, thinker. Right, he mm-hmm. he occasionally reminds me of that that phrase exists. Right, and as a <laughs> as a divorced twenty nine year old, and as I you know live <sighs> my my menial meaningless existence with with no children. Wow, to, don't to be so like, hard you know, on yourself, man. Shit, twenty nine like and you don't have five children. Is he's pushing you to have kids? Is that what you? No, he's not. He's really not pushy about it. But it's just like throws it in there. You know, when every are you now gonna and give then. me grandkids? Yeah, it's not even like that. It's just he's just like. He's more like, well, you know, the Bible says uh, a, 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 a quiverful man is a, you know, oh, I don't no. know, whatever. <laughs> I'm just like, yeah, it's just, it does say that. I have, I have a weird confession to make. Um, my ex-wife and I, we started trying to have a kid because of watching the Duggars. Uh, back when we were like in that, oh my gosh, I can't even believe I'm saying this stuff. I've met the Duggars. Deep or Have you? Oh, you've met the Duggars. Because they're like the most quiverful of all quiverfuls. They, they they're the, the quiverest of all quivers. Quivers, <laughs> quivers right? Um, How did you meet them? I met them at a homeschool conference uh, okay. and with Doug Phillips, who's actually even what? bigger into, oh, I knew Doug Phillips. Wait, oh, from man. like Westboro? No, no, no. That's no, different Freddie Phillips. Phelps. Oh, gosh. Okay. My heart. Oh, okay. We're good. <laughs> so you, you met them at a homeschool conference. Yeah. Homeschool convention. Oh, Interesting. Yeah, they were nice wow. people. The children worked very hard. Yeah. Their older children worked very hard. Well, of course they did. Yeah. At, at cheating on Ashley Madison. Hey, now. Huh. That's a little too close to home. Yeah. Okay. So you you got involved with these, these homeschool groups. And then at what point were you... Did you feel pressure to start going to church or how did that happen or? Yeah. I mean, they, they taught me a lot about, um, putting together my curriculum. They gave me a lot of confidence in dealing with this and doing it at home and mm-hmm. that I really could do it. Um, it is which, a really supportive It has to be community. daunting. Yeah. It's, a, absolutely. it's very right. supportive. Yeah. yeah. And, um, I learned so much from them on that end. I just kind of, you know, you start hanging out with them, you start going to things with them and the stuff I was going to with them was church stuff. You know, and so I started going to church with them. And, and that's when I met you. Oh, <laughs> yeah, kind yeah. of. And um, yeah, so I just started going to church with them. And my marriage was really bad at the time. And oh, they had all kinds of marriage advice. And tell us about that. Oh, the marriage advice. <sighs> it was it really good. <laughs> Chuck's never listened to the podcast before. <laughs> 
Um, it. My husband really liked the advice. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> you know, it's I all about see. submission, submitting to him, putting right. him on a pedestal, helping him with everything. The focus of the whole family became on him. Right. And, you know, as the leader, and even if he was a bad leader, he was to be the leader. Mm-hmm. And, what if something you know, bad happens? Like if you guys had made a bad decision or something in your family, did he take... No, that was me. That was my fault. That meant I wasn't Mm. doing my wifely duties very well. Uh, I wasn't supporting him like I should. He would have handled it better if you If I had been doing what I was supposed to be doing. Right. Wow. Yeah. So this is like some pretty pretty toxic teaching. It really is. I mean, I spent... There's a bunch of things you can do for 30 days or 31 days or whatever in this prayer time and putting your husband on this pedestal and you don't ever say one bad word about him. You try not to have any bad thoughts about him. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, that's... Wait, what was the 30-day thing? Was like a program that you would do or... It was a challenge you took on and you would not have... Anytime you had a bad thought about your husband, you would push it out. You would have no bad thoughts. You would say 10 good things. I mean, is that the recipe for brainwashing? Oh my God. That's like, I mean, like... I've never thought of it from this way, from this angle, but you're right. I've I've heard about those kinds of teachings, but I've never heard about them going so far as to control your thinking. Wow. Right. And I mean, that's not an unusual thing in in Christianity, right? To like, thoughts, thinking of thoughts as sinful, which is like, I think, incredibly, you know, toxic. But um, yeah, that's... It's really intense stuff. So how did so did you go into this and and just sort of like buy it for a while, and then there was a time where you where you woke up and were like, I don't believe this anymore, or were you always kind of on the fence about it, or did you feel obligated? I just tried it. At the time, I was willing to try anything to save my marriage because I didn't oh, okay. want him to end up with custody. Oh. Um, if we should get divorced, and right. so I I just tried everything to save the marriage. So you were in a in a in a pinch you were between a rock and a hard place i really was yeah. and and my children right there and to me it was all about protecting my children mm-hmm. it was oh, giving them the best mm-hmm. and so i stuck with them and then you know homeschooled and when i tried the um the 30 day thing it, it got better it got better for me because i was no longer thinking all the bad thoughts it right. got better for him because i wasn't quite as bitter mm-hmm. i guess because i wasn't thinking all the bad thoughts but did it improve any behaviors no it did not it didn't improve any of any of the behaviors that were causing the tr- problem mm-hmm. all it did was stop me from fighting it right it right. allowed him to behave that way even more mhm um, and, it, and he caught on to that. He slowly grew into it. And he's like, oh, where are you going to church? Where are you learning this from? Where are we getting this from? And he started grabbing um, his knowledge that he knew. I was going to say the Bible, but that's not what he grabbed. He grabbed books that these people wrote about what they say the Bible says. Okay. And he was reading a lot on those. And then he got really into finding the correct church to be in. And uh, okay. He never even found one that was conservative enough. The church wow. that we went to, Brady, he didn't think was conservative enough. Wow. Oh my God. And we've, we've my all, heart is we've, breaking. Like I can yeah. hear it because I'm just like, here you are walking into this situation out of a, um, a very uh, in, in, a guttural maternal instinct, right? Right, like, of wanting to take care of your, 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 your kid. Kids, and who then, are actually literally in danger. Right. Yeah. And now, because of that, you you tried to find a solution that just even made it worse and worse. And what it sounds like to me is that um, through these weird teachings, what made things work for a while with your husband is the fact that you just took away your preferences. You took away your opinions. You took away your ability to speak out and say, no, this isn't the right way that we should go. We need to have go a different direction. But that took that away from you. That took away yes, your voice. Yes, very much so. Yeah. I, I, my children ask me, my son specifically asked me, would you do it again? And my answer is, hell yes. <laughs> Absolutely. It was do for it my again. children to go, if, go do, through all this again. Um, because I did it for my children. I did it to protect my children. Um, but did, is that what happened? I protected my children in one way. I protected them from some of the danger they would have been in by themselves with him. Okay. Right. Um, and 
Right, because there would have been a custody battle if she right. just up and, and left. And I had nothing. I had nothing to go on other right. than what I had witnessed, yeah. and that was it. That's all I had. So you were still there as a protector, though. Even yes, all this, this way I could protect them. And actually, mm-hmm. with homeschooling, I was working a lot less, and so mm-hmm. I gave up part of my career. Actually, my career just ended up on hold um, while I stepped back from that and focused on my children. And so I get put invested a lot in my children to protect them and help them grow up to be um, healthy adults. It, they're normal humans. They're not super healthy. They have problems. They have issues. And they do have issues with having come from the super conservative church. Chuck, do we know anything about having issues? Oh, Brady. No, I'm fine. Yeah, we're, we're fine here. So um, I don't know how you got into this house, but right. we don't understand anything you're talking about at all. Yeah. How, how did you view non-Christians during this time? You know, I totally forgot where I was coming from. Mm -hmm. Um, I I would look at things and I felt sorry for anybody who was a non-Christian because here I had become a Christian and look, it was so much better. You know, Mm -hmm. I I actually loved my husband where I didn't love him before and um, things were getting better. I always said that things were getting better and I just realized that was coming out of my mouth without me even thinking of it, things getting better. Um, What specifically was getting better? You know, I can't tell you what got better. Less arguments because I didn't argue. A very superficial idea of what a healthy relationship looks like, right? I mean, that's what was, quote unquote, getting better. Yes, and it was very superficial. And it got to be, um, there was, was, I was very well trained. I became very, very well trained. I think that's a good term for it. Because I, mm-hmm. I, I relate with that. I felt the answers that I gave and the things that I believed and, and the actions that I would do was was all about training. It's, it's all about conditioning. Yes. Yeah, it's it's Pavlovian. Very much so. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So I, I remember at times like this, I, I would view non-Christians um, as less thans. That, you yes. know, they weren't capable of the things that of thinking of certain ways. And this wasn't something that was like explicitly taught or explicitly thought. It was just kind of like a lingering filter in which I viewed everything as, you know, we have the truth and they don't. And yeah. there's kind of like a, I'm greater than that. thing. Mm-hmm. Yes, very much so. How different do you think your marriage would have been if you guys didn't go down the Christian conservative route like would it have ended sooner or i think it could have gone two ways it could have either ended sooner or it could have improved um because of his mental illness Mm -hmm. he in the christian community he was encouraged not to take his medicine um he was encouraged (sighs) to just get right with god Mm. um and then with his particular mental illness handing over everything to him was really like the worst thing you could do for him because not only he he has bipolar disorder yes which i I don't know if we've said that yet but yeah yeah bipolar disorder right and um handing over the finances when he's in a manic state right is not a wise thing to do he Um, would go off on who knows what kind of like harebrained sort of uh he's feeling like anything is possible uh, like he can accomplish whatever and exactly. it, and it doesn't matter what happens to this money because it's everything's fine or exactly. everything's great. Exactly. Yeah. It, and, and when he was super depressed to put him in charge of anything, he wouldn't do anything. So. Wow. Um, we need to take a break. And when we get back, I want to talk a little bit more about this, but then I want to hear what it was like and how you started to get away from all of this and how your life changed that way. Um, So we'll be right back in just a minute. Do you have a story you want to tell us? Or a question you want answered? Do you need advice on how to handle family members who are upset at you because you're wrestling with your beliefs or leaving your religion? Have you experienced some weird religious shit that you need to tell people that might actually get it? Then contact us. Go to thelifeafter.org, all one word, and click the contact us page. Or Facebook us at facebook.com backslash the life after org. Or email us at info at the life after dot org. We would love to hear, hear from. Uh, let's do it together. 
Okay. One, two, three. We'd, We'd love, love to, to hear, hear from, from you. you. Or when you email us, send us a voice recording. We really like that too. Okay, we're back with Marnie. And uh, where we left off was Marnie and kind of like a catch 22. Right. So, mm-hmm. Marnie, uh, I, I wanted to ask you this. So, Brady asked you before the break um, it, if you had any insight into how your life would be different if you hadn't gotten sort of sucked into this conservative Christian culture, right? Yeah. Um, and I, I think um, from what we talked about earlier, you, you actually did have a little bit of insight into that because you like, later on, you would wind up seeing a secular therapist, right? Yes. So, yes. so a non-Christian therapist. So you, you it can actually literally juxtapose the kind of counseling you got in church versus outside of church. So you had this very patriarchal very much favoring your husband who was mentally ill, who was not uh, really a very good leader, not a very good, you know, example. Yes, it was always something I had to do. I had to fix. How is it different? How is it different when you when you talked to uh, your, your secular therapist? Was it notably different? Extremely so. It was a turning point for me. Yeah. Um, I went to her. We both went to her and she talked to my husband at the time the first two sessions she did nothing but talk to him it was just him and her talking away at the end of the second session she asked him to leave the room and she directly asked me what makes you think he's going to change yeah and yeah Yeah. she said you know his diagnosis you've Uh been with him 24 years what makes you think he's going to change yeah i knew then it was right. somebody flipped a switch for me. Right. No, but if if our church, our old church, would have asked you that, you would have had an answer, and would have been trusting in God and having faith or or whatever. Absolutely, I I, I would have known exactly what to say yeah. if it had been the church because you don't you don't think you just have wrote answers. You know what answers they want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And but here I knew when she said that. You knew. I knew she, he wasn't going to change. She gave. She literally gave you permission to say, like, "Oh, I, this is what I actually think, and I really don't think that this is going anywhere." Right. 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 Yeah. And what you know, what also hit me was is knowing how tightly knit that community is that we came from, um, how dangerous it is to get counseling from them. Very much. Because so. your relationship with the one who was doing the counseling was very intimate. I mean, that, that there was somebody who was in our lives on a regular basis, et cetera. So, I mean, that, so you don't that have, you don't have objectivity. Mm-hmm. You have, it's not an objective third party, which is a really important part of, of counseling and couples counseling. Right. So this is actually kind of, this is, this is something that's really important for me personally. Um, and that is that, uh, conservative Christian culture and even just it, the Bible in general, there are lots of things that either contradict or just don't address certain mental health issues. So it's really hard to counsel somebody biblically, quote unquote, and simultaneously uh, acknowledge modern psychology in a way that's effective, right? Um, So I think it's really important to sort of acknowledge that even, I mean, I even know like some, some counselors, like some professional psychologists that 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 identify as christians but i've i've confronted them on on certain things and in certain issues where like i think the bible contradicts what modern psychology teaches and their answer is almost kind of well i i mean i really don't know how to how to reconcile those things and usually they you know like the good ones will err on the side of psychology i think um, and then, but, but you're forced to make that choice, right? And, you know, between patriarchy and actually doing what's, what's good for a family or what's good for a woman. Um, and it, it's difficult at best and at worst, it's extremely toxic, which is what you, Marnie, encountered, uh, in, in the church that you were a part of. Yes. So, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I digress, but. No, it makes sense. I feel that it's a lot of putting yourself in the position of a faith of like, okay, well, God is going to do this. And so I'm going to prepare myself. I'm going to put myself in a vulnerable position as if what he, what I'm having faith in is going to happen. So, I mean, here you are putting yourself in a position of submission 
Um, but if that if he doesn't come through and answer the prayer the way that you want him to, that you're positioning yourself for, you're just making yourself vulnerable for more abuse and more control. And it's a cycle that doesn't stop. You would just end up giving up more and more and more because that's what the church counselors would tell you. Um, you're not doing enough. So then I would go home and do more. And no, you must not be doing enough because it didn't get fixed. You know, and God's teaching you a lesson. Wow. And would it be fair to say that that meanwhile you as a person are just shrinking? You're just pretty much. You're yeah. giving up your more and more of yourself to the point where you 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 feel you start to feel like you don't matter, right? I mean, you're just digressing. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um disappear altogether. Right. Really? Yeah. Yeah. And these people are so involved in our lives. You know, and everyday life, everyday life. And so for them to give counseling and everything had a lot of implications of your social life, your home life, all of this. Um, When you started to pull away and started to kind of like distance yourself from that, how did people respond? How did they treat you? Um, Well, I had people coming up and asking to pray with me Mm -hmm. to pray asking why I wasn't in church. Do you want me to go in and what my friend said? I do. I, I see in your face that there's something hurtful that's coming up. And if you're, if you're comfortable sharing with it, I'd, I'd love to hear. Okay. I, when I took it to my best friend that I would say at the time, she told me, I told her that I was thinking about, you know, my marriage and um, I got some good counseling for it. Uh, she admonished me for not going to a Christian counselor. And then I explained that I was considering divorce, that I think that that would be the healthiest for me and the children, even though my children were adults by that time. Um, but they still lived at home, two of the three did. And I felt that that would be the healthiest. And uh, she told me that um, I was... I had some bad teaching. That's what happens when you don't go to a Christian counselor. Um, she told me I was obviously not saved. Um, wow. And she told me that she was not going to be able to, if I continued to pursue this, she was not going to be able to speak to me um, in hopes that it would bring me back to the faith. I, I'm, I'm dumbfounded by that because on top of everything you just said, which is outrageous on its own, but even from their viewpoint, you, I, I mean, I know you, you had the right for divorce. You, he yeah. wasn't faithful to you. No, he was not faithful. Um, how did they justify that even with their belief system that you would not have the rights or the, the, the justification of leaving an unfaithful husband? <laughs> what they said is God hates divorce. That's the same thing they said to me. Yeah, that God hates divorce so much that although, yeah, he did allow it possibly with unfaithfulness, is, is that really why I'm divorcing him? It feels like they're trying to draw out some like deeper meaning from you. Didn't that make you question yourself, even though you shouldn't have been questioning yourself? It, I questioned myself a lot, a lot. I started driving a lot, traveling. I would drive 16, 18 hours in a day. Oh my God. Thinking and talking to myself, uh, trying to get my thoughts straight. Mm, mm -hmm. So you were figuring out who I was. You had really lost yourself at at that point. Absolutely. You were were looking. Trying to get through all the rote answers to what I was really thinking. Right. Who, Who was there for you? Was there anyone there for you? Strangely enough, my children. Mm, My children, especially my son. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and my oldest one tried to be there. She, being autistic, it's difficult sometimes right. for her. But my son was there. Um, my mom and my sister, whom I hadn't talked to in a very long time, very much. I hadn't talked to my mother much at all because she's not a believer. So I really didn't mm-hmm. talk to her much. Okay. She would say she is, but the church didn't. Oh, so you, you even she, they she, even she, sort of like had you sort of force other people out of your lives at that point. Or out of your life at that point. Yes. Kind of like they tell you the abusive relationship. They cut off everybody else from you. Right. I had everybody. That's, that's the gaslighting that, that Brady talks about. Yeah. Very much um, gaslighting. Yes. Yeah. 
And, you know, it's it's not that they walk into it and say, hey, how can I cut you off from it? But there's just, there's like an overarching attitude. And what I keep on hearing from you and what I keep on being reminded of from when I went to that same church is just how much power that just this social construct around it had of these different attitudes and these different beliefs that even though they weren't set out explicitly, they were very, very, very much present. Yes, very much so. I can't even point at one person and say it stemmed from them. It didn't. It didn't. It, it mm-hmm. was an overarching thought process that ran underneath. A culture. Yeah. Yes. It was the culture. Yeah. It, it, and I've been thinking about that because there, there are a lot of scenarios where it's hard to blame anybody in particular. It's mm-hmm. just everybody sort of it subscribed to this way of thinking and it, it, it sort of pushes everybody around in different ways and everybody is subject to it, you know? And I mean, there are definitely, there are toxic people in those scenarios for sure that you can point, point at, but, uh, in a, in a lot of cases, it's just, this is how we all thought and we all just bought into it and we all sort of hurt each other on accident, you know, almost like, yes. It- I really think, too, that some of the people who are in that situation, they're just not closely allied with somebody who's so toxic, so they just don't believe it happens. Yeah. I think they think they're protected from that, that they've done enough right things, even mm-hmm. though mm-hmm. it's not by works of righteousness, is what they would say. Sure, right. But, but, but what they actually, the way they actually live suggests otherwise. S- suggests right? yeah. very much that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it must be something you've done. I heard that so many times. Oh. It must be something you've done wrong. Wow. Like, uh, I mentioned before, like in the very first episode of my intro, um, I talked about how uh, whenever my ex-wife did file for divorce, they wanted me to go and apologize for anything I could have done to make her want to cheat. And that yeah. was my breaking point where I just yeah. said, no, absolutely not. I can't take responsibility for that. Right. Um, that, that, that's outrageous. And, and, you know, it's, there's even a part of me that started to pity her because mm. I could tell that they were putting, they were make they were influencing her to come back home three mm-hmm. or four times mm-hmm. and she didn't want to be back. Mm-hmm. Obviously, you know, she wanted to go do her own thing, but they wanted her to do that. They wanted so badly to have a story of redemption to tell mm-hmm. that it didn't matter what they had to trample on over with me, um, they, it didn't matter how much damage it would do as long as they got to that that thing. Mm-hmm. And um, eventually I just said, similar to what you said, hey, there's there's mental health issues at play here. Mm-hmm. You guys are not ch- you guys are not educated in that. You're not equipped to counsel us. Mm-hmm. And that was a turning point where they got very upset at me because I stood up to that. Um, and eventually that's what led to me being disfellowshipped. You know, that thing about, it's almost like a lot of churches are are looking for a, a trophy for their case, you know? Sometimes mm-hmm. with these, like the more difficult the situation, the harder they want to just force it to go the way that it is supposed to so that they have a story. And it's almost to a degree, maybe they're trying to prove to themselves that what they believe is the best way. You know what I mean? So after I got disfellowshipped, I, I met with them for three three months and with a third party. And eventually they, they admitted to me that they were wrong for disfellowshipping me. And oh. they said that they would apologize to me. But that mm-hmm. took another two or three months and it was still me saying, Hey, what's going on here? You said you're going to apologize. They're like, Oh, we've got other things we're working through right now. So it's, it's kind of like, uh, it's apologize. Like, right. Why is that hard? That's an, it's an apology that needs to happen. And if it really was, why a real does it apology, have to be so contrived that it takes months to exactly, um, in the situation that we're in, were you ever like officially disfellowshipped or kicked out or excommunicated or anything like that? I was not officially disfellowshipped. From any institution, uh, fellow homeschoolers disfellowshipped me and quit speaking directly to me. They spoke to me in third person. What? Yeah. Like, give me an example. What do they say to you? How is Marnie today? Brady <laughs> Brady wants to know how Marnie is. Was it like that or what was it like? It, it was weird. more, um, if the wife wanted to preserve 
the oh marriage. My God. What? Whoa. If the woman wanted to remain a Christian, that's worse than third person. That's how my that's how my preschooler talks because that's how his preschool teachers talk to him. Oh, we don't do that. Oh, so if I yeah. do something bad, he's like, "Daddy, we don't say." That. I'm like, "Oh my gosh, what right. are you doing?" That's it's dehumanizing. So- very much so, yeah. When we get back, forget this dehumanizing stuff. I want to figure out who you are now. I want to figure out who Marnie is, who she has figured out on these 16-hour-long car drives around the place. <laughs> um, so stick yes. with us for after this, and then we are going to get into some good news and figure Ooh. out who Marnie is now and what has improved. Scary. if you were gonna die tonight do you know where you stop just tell them about our website oh just tell them to go to the lifeafter.org yes they can go now even without accepting jesus christ as their personal lord and savior (laughs) the lifeafter.org we have a blog contact page a link to our facebook page and more all right, thelifeafter.org. Heavenly. Welcome back. Um, we are here with Marnie. In the last segment, we we left on like a sour note where it just felt like you were in a help, helpless situation, hopeless. Um, and I'm so glad that you got out of that. Um, when we were on our break, we asked you who was there for you. And you told us your family and you told us one other group of people. Who were they? Everybody else had sort of left, right? Left Out after your divorce. Everyone, yes. Who was there for you? <laughs> I love this answer. Facebook friends. Facebook friends. From but a like, game. From a game. From a game. Because you said like, game. well, you, at first you're like, my gamer friends. I just picture you playing like World of Warcraft right, or something. Right, right. But I mean, who were these Facebook people? What, what game were you playing? I was playing Knighthood on Facebook. And yes. Yeah, I... We had a guild, you know, or... <laughs> right. Oh my God, that is and, so perfect. And, and you talk on Skype and you just talk. You don't see these people face to face. They they stood with me. And that's a lot of times that's where I was driving to go to was to go visit them. I started meeting them in person. Yeah, they stood cool. with me. They they stepped up. Complete strangers. Complete strangers. Yes. Did you ever meet any of them in person? Yes, I did. I've, I've met a handful of them in person. Wonderful people. Really wonderful people. I still talk to a few of them, and um, yeah, they were there for me, very so the much. Next there time for you me. get a, a, and some of them identify as Christian and still liked me. <laughs> yeah, well, there's such a wider from from what I've noticed, and I'm so glad you're in my life, Chuck, because right. you, you know now you see kind of where Marnie and I came right. from. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And we, yeah. And so it's it's easy to just look at all of this like ultra conservative, just like manipulative stuff and, and be against it. But I also recognize that there's so many other different varieties and, and arrays of Christians of um that that are good, that are less strict. And how do you identify now? Do you identify as atheist or agnostic or I'm still I still call myself a Christian. You still consider yourself a Christian. That's cool. awesome. I do. Yeah. I do. I think you're the first person from our podcast that still identifies as Christian. I think that's great. Yeah, yeah. I mean, hey, takes all kinds. So far. Also, the <laughs> next time you get a, a farm town invite on Facebook. <laughs> that could be somebody know. needed, needed that help. could be your lifelong acquaintance. <laughs> Some of these people ended up married. Like they married each other. Yes. Within your guild. Wow. Not within my guild. With an other guilds. Oh. But yes. Oh wow. Inter guild relationships. Oh yeah. See, because the Bible says you're not supposed those. to do <laughs> inter guild. <laughs> uh, Chuck is interracial. Multiracial is the word now. <laughs> now that you've walked away from conservative Christianity, you would identify as a more of a liberal Christian. Is yes. that fair to say? Okay. Um, but what things do you still hold on to that is kind of uh, transferred or held on into this new life of yours that you would look at and say, okay, that's that's a good thing that it's still here. One of the things is honesty, being honest. How so? Um, it's it, it's playing the long the long game. Sometimes it makes life it may make life harder in the short run, but in the long run, it's easier if you're just honest and you're just mm-hmm. upfront with people. Mm-hmm. You know, especially in relationships with other. With other humans, because humans are amazing people. I mean, <laughs> humans are just amazing creatures. They really are. Yeah. And most just want good things. 
Mm-hmm. They don't want evil for each other. They mm-hmm. don't they don't walk around as unfeeling things. They have mm-hmm. feelings. They want love. They want to help. When you walked away from the faith, were you afraid of what your new desires or your new wants would be? Absolutely. I was I was terrified. I kn- I knew that I was bisexual. Wow. Um, I had had a relationship actually in junior high. And um, I was told to totally deny all that. And I was very afraid of allowing any of that back in because that would, I was taught that was my choice. Right. Right. You know, and so I'd always fight all those thoughts and all those feelings towards women. And I was the same way, but but as just gay, um, constantly having to fight that and deny yourself. You felt like I felt like I was doing something religious or good that God would appreciate. Yes, right? I felt like I was working so hard on it. I felt like that was part of my accomplishments. And look at the good I've done. Is I'm more normal now that I have fought that mm-hmm. down and battled that. And so and i don't i feel better now that i've accepted it that that's just who i am right and well, I, so i feel and i you know i'm not i i didn't have an i didn't have to come out or anything i'm a regular straight straight old dude but um <laughs> right <laughs> but, to sleep. but uh upon you know upon uh leaving my religious beliefs i did i was able to sort of be a lot more honest about my own sexuality just in general right because mm-hmm. they're all they're you know they're all kinds of rules for for everybody sexually right uh and i feel like it like it it's hard for me to ex- to explain that to people that are still christians because they sort of see it like oh well that's just sex why is that a big deal? But I feel like it's like having, it's like if I lived in this house where we're recording and I had a room that I never opened and one day I just decided like, I wonder what's in here. You know what I mean? And, and it's like this part of my life and myself that I had never had permission to understand. And it's not just literally the physical act of sex or the physical feeling of sex or even the the uh you know sort of metaphysical aspects of it it's literally parts of yourself that you've never accessed that can affect all kinds of different parts of your life do you guys feel like that absolutely like, well the church teaches uh, so many con- conflicting things about about sex anyway right you know i mean on one hand they're telling you how wonderful it is but don't talk about it yeah you know and uh they're saying oh this is you know, for marriage, this is the ultimate gift, but, you know, make sure you're doing it right. And, right. Oh, follow these rules right here, but, you know, never tell him no. Um, right. You know, yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It, I don't I don't think the church knows what they think, but they're refusing to say that. Yeah. And it's such uh, an incredible, beautiful thing. And, and it can all, because it's such an in, intimate, wonderful thing that happens between two humans, it can be used for a lot of violence. But right. um, it's... It, it's a strange attitude that the church has towards sex. Yeah, it's a very strange it's, attitude. Uh, it's very constricting. It's very uh, like for me a big a big thing was uh, d- like sex is huge and it's monumental and it affects every aspect of your life. But in, in, until you're married, don't don't mess with it. Like avoid it at all costs until you're ma- until until one day you have you you have to share with somebody that you've never shared it with. It's a very Victorian attitude. Yeah. Even though they would think it's very scriptural, it's not. It's a very Victorian attitude. Right. Because- In scripture, there's all kinds of sex. I mean, right. there's there's just all over the place. They have whole books written for it. Right, right. Literally, you know? like the Song of Solomon is literally a book about sexuality, about human I, sexuality. I used to post verses on Facebook quoting from the Song of Solomon on my ex's wall. Just and, to troll And him. they were... <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> And they were nasty verses. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I guess I was thumbing my nose at the church even then before I there left. There you go. Wonderful. <laughs> but yeah. Um, you know, one of the funny things. This is just funny to me that I always point out to Christians is that the Bible never like explicitly condemns like polygamy, for example. Right. Oh it's my like, goodness! Like, it's they, like this they... huge cultural taboo. Well, they go in the whole like, oh, we will only believe in the biblical uh, definition of marriage. You're like, oh. 
which one? <laughs> it, it, it's so true. Yeah. The only time, the only time it ever bans that I can remember in, you know, poor me, but um, is church leaders can't have to more than one wife. Right, right, right. Everybody it's else just, is all okay. Yeah, Timothy is like, oh, if you want to be a deacon, you can't have more than one wife. But then no, that's the only it, time it ever comes up. Right. That's exactly. And you know what? It never really says that women can't have more than one husband. And I'm all for that. Right. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, on a, on a much more serious note, and I've I've gotten into this when, uh, when Christians want to argue with me about homosexuality, I'm like, well, the Bible never explicitly condemns pedophilia. And that is a big deal. And it's like, they, I felt it right now. The room just gets quiet. Right. It's the moment I mean, seriously, though, in. like, um, that, like this is something that we, as, as humans, independent of scripture, have decided is a bad thing. Mm-hmm. And it's, we believe that very strongly. And that tells me that morality can come from lots of different sources. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. And you know, that's weird because I... I had a hard time trusting myself and I still do to this day. Now that I've walked away from the faith and I'm away from it all, like there's still times where I'm like, am I doing what's right? Mm -hmm. Can I be trusted Mm -hmm. without these rigid rules and all of this? Um, Did you experience that at all? Or was yours a little bit more freeing than mine? I, I think some people just, they get away and they keep on running but I, I kind of run it, but I still kind of like looked back a little bit and, you know. I catch myself following certain rules sometimes, um, trying to stay within the lanes, so to speak. But no, I, I, I think, I, I don't, I don't think God's that involved. Um, I don't think he's going to sit there and judge us right then. If he was, would the world be the way it is? I mm. mean, you know, it's like, is he is he answering all their prayers? They mm-hmm. say, oh, they love to say that. You know, he's answered the prayer. We had enough people praying. So there's like so many people. What's the number? Is it 20% of the people that you know must right. be praying and what, for and this what if request? you're not popular? What if you're not popular, you don't know that exactly. people? Or right. what if you're a child alone, orphaned child right. who's in a war zone? You're not going to have anybody praying for you, yeah. you know, yeah. that knows you. So I guess that doesn't count. Those poor orphans. Oh, well. Right. Um, I just don't think he's that involved. Yeah. And, um, but you know, maybe he's more involved. I don't know. I don't presume to know, and I'm not going to tell anybody else what to do or feel. Um, yeah. but what is, what is God? Cause you still believe in God, um, I do. which is great. What, what is his relationship with you now? Like how, how do you view him and how do you practice? Um, I talk to him a lot still, but it's really more of a conversation. I, I'm not praying requests to him. Sometimes it's more of, uh, roll my eyes and think, really? Don't you think, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Um, I think he's more just observing. Mm -hmm. I mean, if if there is an omnipotent God who knows everything and can control everything but chooses not to to, and chooses to let us be in sin, um, then why would he fix anything right now when it's all about the hereafter anyway? Mm -hmm. Uh, Why? He could just go ahead and let us learn what we're going to learn here and let it go. You and know, then... yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. That, that really strikes a chord with me personally, because a, a big reason why I left Christianity was because I've heard every explanation for suffering over and over and over, you know what I mean? And, and, and like, I mean, obscure ones, good ones, popular ones. And it, to, at the end of the day, it's so much easier for me to just believe in an, in an indifferent God. It's just, mm. you know, it's, it's like, or chaos. You know what I mean? It's like yeah. either God is, either God is indifferent or he's not all powerful or, or, or there is no God and, and everything is just. It, if it, heaven is what, it, what, what they say it is, if heaven is what, you know, you would get out of scripture, why would he want to change anything here on earth? Cause anything we're suffering is only going to make that better. I mean, that's supposed right, to be right. wonderful you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. the ultimate place to be anyway. So why not just go ahead and let us learn the lessons that we need to learn sure. down here until we get there. So it's Maybe interesting because it. you had those different categories. I definitely mm-hmm. landed on, well, there is no God. Sure. Um, yeah. And, and there's a lot of other reasons that I, that I've went into that. Um, but I listen to you and your beliefs and I don't feel threatened or uncomfortable around them. I, I feel that 
It's, um, it's oh, a conversation. Good. You're a trustworthy person. And I love that you put such an emphasis on honesty. And when I hear you speak, I hear empathy and care. And I, I hear you gone through so much that you don't want that for other people. Not at all. I don't want to judge other people. I don't want to put people in a box or make them stay in a box. Mm -hmm. I want them to be what they've been created to be, mm -hmm. you know, and, and experience whatever's out there for them to experience. Let me ask you this then. Um, what would you say to somebody who is in the situation that you were in? Or another way of wording that is, what would you say now to Marnie back then? What advice would you give? To value. Value you. Mm -hmm. I would tell myself to value myself. My thoughts wow. and ideas are mine. Um, they're not all bad and evil. And are any of them bad and evil? They're, it's just a part of me. It's a part of who I am on them. Um, and it, it's okay to go against the to go against the flow, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you're not going to change other people's behavior, but you can certainly change yourself. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, what would you, you say know? about your your bisexuality? My bisexuality? I, I would have said, you are who you are. Embrace that and mm -hmm. just go with it. You know? When I came out to a friend of mine, um, we were having a conversation, and she stopped the conversation, and she looked at me, and she says, you're not a pervert. And it sounds so small, but really it meant so much to me because I think with you and me and in growing up with church and, and all of this, we're taught that that's such a atrocity. It's so perverted um, that it, you, you have this self-shaming. and We just were taught hear, it was a bad thing mm -hmm. and that we did it. We chose it. Yes. <laughs> and why would we? Why would we, Marnie? Why would we choose... The it, it, most difficult a, path of of self hatred, exactly. self denial, all of this. Why would we choose that? Uh, it's something I fought for so long and was so proud of that I conquered and put behind me, um, and it only hurt me that I conquered it and put it behind me. That just hurt me, and, and now that I'm, this is who I am. This is this is what I am made to be. Um, it's. I'm more confident in myself and I know it's not evil. Mm -hmm. I, it is just what I am. Yeah. That's beautiful. I love that. Just be, just be you, what you and are. accept it <laughs> Yeah, and accept it. I mean, and that's something we teach kids and, and is looked down upon in the church of like, Oh, that's so liberal. It's funny that that's like, that it's like a, it's like a thing we teach kids. And then, but when you hit a certain age, it's like, but don't, but don't do that. As long as it's not this like way. We, yeah. Remember, we told you that your entire childhood. Be yourself, but don't be yourself. We were just kidding. It's a shame. Marnie, I want to thank you again so much for coming today um, and having this conversation. I, I'm so glad we caught up. Oh, thank you. And your story is <laughs> so encouraging to me. Like, if I'm half as badass as you are, <laughs> right? when I get to be your Seriously. age. Seriously. Um, just your independence, your 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 dedication and your uh, what is the word i'm looking for resilience. Not stubborn, resilience thank you of fighting through all of the things that yeah. you you fought through yeah um, and and did it not only for yourself but for your family but also for yourself right yeah that's huge and that is so important like it, that's not selfish that's just being human how can you give to others if you yourself don't have it if you yeah and, and I have people relying on me, so I need to take care of myself. Hey. Thanks, Marnie. Thank you, hey, Brady. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Be yes. yourself, man. I am. I am. You too. I'll work on it. <laughs> Marnie, thank you. Thank you. That was amazing for me to hear somebody from my own past give their story. Um, it's interesting because it has so many of the same characters. Even though we didn't talk to them by about about them by name or anything like that, we had the same characters. We got the same advice, the same marriage advice, the same things that was hurtful. Uh, but when I was able to walk away from it, when Marty was able to walk away from it, that's when we were able to finally find ourselves. Um, I also just want to repeat her advice to any of you who are listening. 
uh, may be going through a difficult time or whatever, just accept who you are and don't look at yourself as a, as a monster or as a mistake or a sinful person or whatever. Um, allow yourself to be you and take comfort in that and take um, encouragement in that and just have your head up high. Um, Marnie nailed it. That's what I want to be like when I get older. I want to thank you all so much for listening today. We'll see you next week.